Uh, good morning, Ruber. This is our second part of the interview. Uh, hoping everything's well with you, and thank you very much for uh, allocating time for for to talk to us. Um, so let's go back to where we were. You released your a new album called Into Colors in November uh, 2015 in the UK, Ireland, and Japan, peaking to number 12 on the UK charts. That's pretty good. Uh, and the album was released uh, well, well in 2017. I noticed the, the first single, Dangerous, is very up-tempo, up -tempo number, mm -hmm. and uh, it was released in every radio. I think I was playing a lot. Of, feel free to elaborate what you recall, what you remember about that. Album well, also. Dangerous was a song that um, when, uh, was it, I remember the first bit, is your love too dangerous? And I immediately said, and I can hear it on the tape. Oh, I said, oh, that's disco. That sounds like disco. Um, and so I tend to go with it. If the song is presenting a certain way, I tend to just follow the song. Yeah. Um, and that's really so we decided to take it all the way there. If it was gonna, if it sounded a little bit disco, we thought, well, let's just do disco. Yeah, I think the disco is like the first probably 20, 30 seconds. Then it became like a sort of normal beat, uh, I suppose. Mm. It, uh, but it works out well. And uh, well, and, that uh, song is yeah. about, and you know, as as I spoke to you, you know, about previously when I described to you, you know, how unwell I got in the music industry. Yeah, dangerous was a song about um, um, feeling like, why am I doing going back into this? You know, I'd, I'd spent a year out of the music business. I was just getting better. I was just starting to feel better, and I thought, I'm really going to go back into this this situation that's going to that made me ill and so dangerous was a song about you know i've only just begun you know i've only just started to feel better babe like it was just like it, it's about a, it, it sounds like a love song but it was actually about my fear of going back into the industry again how you manage what's happened the year uh the, the year that year or the year it, before no the year before in, in between when you say no i'm I need to do something else for a living. And then a oh, year after you decided, well, I'm, I'm going back. This is my life. That's what I like. And I need to put well, myself together and so forth. I mean, I was just, I just, I just sort of self-funded myself for a year writing in Los Angeles. Yeah. And, um, you know, really came, was dragged back into the music industry, kind of kicking and screaming to a certain extent. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I was very hesitant to go back into that situation um, because I wasn't fully recovered, you know? So even on the album cover, I look a bit scared. Like I look a bit like nervous. Yeah. So, so, so Intercolor was really about recovery and about keeping, you know, just, just keep you just going back into a situation that was, um, was was scary for me because you know I, I had almost I'd really got very sick got very ill yeah <clears throat> well I'm glad that you got better and I'm glad you continue you know because after that you end up releasing a lot of records it's uh mm -hmm. it's it it's difficult to be a musician I think or an, an artist in general no yes a musician could be a painter or writer mm. it um See, I, I buy CDs, I buy records, Blu-rays, I go to concert. I have no idea about the emotional state mm. of the personality or the psychological issue that a particular band and musician is going through, or if they have a good day's sleep or not. I just show up at A, see a great show from 8 to 10, I go home and go to yeah. work the day after. So, but and for, that's me, the for your end, it's, very, it's a completely different, right? So It is, and that's the thing. At the end of the day, you know, no one wants to know either and no one cares you know you when you're on stage and you've just gotta everything has to fall away and you just have to perform to the best of your ability and do and do good good work consistently um mm. you know nobody wants to know really about the difficulties they just want to enjoy the music and that is how it should be that's exactly how it should be um but you know Intercolor was a record that you know, 
I'm not really singing out on, like I'm singing almost quietly because it was hard for me to, like Rob in a way, Rob, my husband, really kind of pulled me through that record. You know, he, you know, he was instrumental in getting me back in the saddle, you know. Yeah, I know what you mean. And that, that album was a foundation for your uh, 2015 tour days, right? Yes, did the 2015 tour UK and USA. Yeah. Is the crowd very different from England to United States? Or you know yeah. Different or? The, the Americans are a lot more expressive. Yeah. They're a lot more um, in touch with their emotions. So they express their emotions more like, demonstratively. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, the, the British audiences still feel emotions, but they don't always express it. Uh, demonstratively so you know you get different energy from the audience for sure yeah wait until you go to latin america people will go crazy <laughs> <laughs> you know the, the 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 energy of the crowd the emotion of the people and in the united states if you go to latin america you need to multiply it by three well i have to i have to definitely now you've encouraged me to go so yeah oh yeah i will i will I will keep on pushing you going to that direction because it's a good market for you to get into. And people in Argentina and Chile and Mexico, they really love your stuff. And um, do, do you suffer from uh, performance anxiety? Do you get yes, nervous I... every time? Or is how you overcome that? Uh, yes. I mean, I the don't 10 know. minute, 10 minutes, sorry, 10 minutes before you, you go on the stage. And... Mm, it's very difficult because. Um... it's really nothing you can do about it. I tried everything. I tried hypnotherapy, um, tried beta blockers. Actually, the beta blockers are quite good. I think they actually work pretty well, but um, I do suffer from anxiety and a fear before I go on. Um, but, you know, I'm trying to overcome that. And partly why I'm doing this woman to woman tour is about overcoming that because I'm trying to get used to being on the stage in a less pressurizing situation. In fact, that was one of the, my biggest motivations for doing this tour was to try and sort of trick my body into being less frightened on stage because I wasn't uh, carrying the whole show. Um, and so far, I haven't had anxiety on this tour. So that's been really, really positive. Um, but um, I think the material, like some of the Nashville Tears material and um, the Bacharach material gives me more anxiety than the other material because it's very complex it's very lyrical um it's very precise you know i think in a way i've made a rod for my own back in terms of the the scope of the material um because it's difficult material yeah and yeah. um so i'm having to you know now my shows are kind of you know they, they have a quite a, a, a an, like a range of 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 material that um some are more difficult to sing than others um so you know i'm it's, a, it's an ongoing journey for me to be honest with you claudio yeah <clears throat> uh, is improving yeah i need uh yeah i mean <laughs> I, I i get nervous in sometime in interviews or in normal situations in the day-to-day -day life right but uh mm. i cannot imagine you know going in front of x number of people in a particular mm. venue in a particular city and it's tough man well, I'm a, I'm a very ordinary person. You know, I don't have yeah. special powers. You know, I, I don't yeah. have any special powers than anybody else. And so, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I would be as frightened as you or anybody to get on stage in front of people. Yeah. Um, just something that I must do and I must be brave and, and just yeah. you know, go out there and do it. Yeah. And imagine that the first five minutes, right, the first song, then after that you're comfortable again and you everything goes you know you take like a job you you go you you continue right so the first i suppose the first the first song is harder than the rest because then you are in front of the audience and people are applauding and mm -hmm. you're you're getting some uh warm from the public people mm -hmm. in general they they don't understand the amount of work that goes into uh making an album you know the energy the finance the number of people involved it's like a huge yeah. Enterprise, feel free to elaborate on kind of 
you know, whatever you can mention in uh, oh. an end to end album, when you got an idea to how we want to put this together, where it's going to be recorded, who is going to be mm -hmm. engaging, uh, do we need this kind of people, backup vocals, how we pay for it, okay, it's going to cost X number of dollars, how we, you know, what's the return of our investment, all kind of stuff. But... Well, these days, Claudio, mm -hmm. I mean, there's no room for error. You know, there's no margin for error. In the past, I think when they made records in the 70s, they had such big budgets that, you know, you could make a record, scrap it and start again, you know, that kind of thing. But these days, the budgets are so tight that if you have a string date or if you have a, a, a session, you, you really haven't got any room for error. So the preparation becomes more important. So the pre-production element becomes more important. So in order to get the most out of your string date or the most out of your rhythm section dates, which are expensive, um, I found that doing lots and lots of pre-production helps. So make sure that you've, you know, recorded it. Maybe the song has been recorded or demoed three or four times before in different ways, different styles. Like make sure you're absolutely sure about how you want to execute the song, mm. the tempos, the keys, um, the arrangement, um, you know, all that needs to be done way in advance so that you're happy with the with it um, before you go in because there isn't any, you you know, if you, if you make any mistakes or if you don't like something on the day, you, you can't do it again. There's no budget to do it again. Um, so, you know, it is more challenging to make records of high quality that kind of can stand up to the records that were made back in the 70s and 80s yeah. without the budget <clears throat> yeah they, um but yeah pre-production definitely helps and doing a lot of work beforehand and also you know knowing where to spend money and knowing where to, where not to spend money we we generally spend money in on strings um and horns and orchestras or anything like that um and then we try and do um as much as we can at home as well so there's kind of a mixture of home studio um and big studio expensive kind of sessions so my records generally have a combination of both yeah uh, but yeah there's an awful lot of people involved in making a record and and that's part of the pleasure of it that it does employ people it employs studios it employs musicians it employs yep. uh designers, um, um, photographers, you know, there's a lot of people involved. Um, yeah, and it's just a very, it's a wonderful thing to, to, to do from start to finish, and it's incredibly rewarding. Do you worry about, or your husband worried that this producer that, to, okay, if, if, if you add everything up, and um, it costs, I don't know, $50,000 or whatever to, to to create a record, right, from end to end. How you want to record the money? I mean, you do the stuff you do because you like it, but at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's a business, right? You you go on the road because you need to you need to make a living and you, you know, you will not sell that many records, but eventually if the record is good, you say, well, we, you know, we are not going to, record the money on, on on selling merchandise at the end of the show but you know people like the record we have received good reviews we'll go on the road and then record the money on the on the tour on the touring yeah. is that correct? Um, you know a record budget is like the deals go like this where here's the budget to make a record and you get to keep the change oh, okay good yeah but like the artist, well, you can keep the change. Whatever you don't spend on the record, keep the change. But there's never any change because right. you end up spending most of it on the record. That's because right. especially for the Backrack album, I think there was a budget of like $100,000 or something. It was like, I'm making a Backrack album. That was going to cost $100,000. Mm. You know, so that pretty much I did for free, that record. Mm. Um, I didn't, I didn't get... You know that was just we needed we needed to use that money all of that money to um, make the record and that is generally how it's been you know there's hardly been anything left over but in terms of touring 
you know, touring as well is difficult to make money. It's difficult to make money touring. It's difficult to make money with records. Um, for many years now, I've just been looking at it thinking, well, this is um, kind of like almost like a charity. You know, I'm just sort of um, keeping the lights on in the studio so I can keep making more. But I'm not, um, it's not a business, it's not a bit, it's certainly not a business. You know, it's more like a not for profit type of thing. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm able to keep working and to keep making music, but that's it really. You know, there isn't really money in this business. Really? Not, right. There's no middle class in the music industry. Just like there's the middle class is being hollowed out in society you know it's a middle i'm a middle class you know artist in that sense i'm not um i'm not at the you know i i i, I take great care in making high quality work but it's not really a profitable business wow i didn't know that I knew, mm. but not to that extent, because, right, when you when you go on tour, you need to catch a fly, a tour buyer, you need to stay in a hotel, somebody pick you up from the hotel to the venue, and then venue to the hotel, and then fly back, blah, 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 right? So it's mm. it's a lot of expenses involved in touring, right? Unless touring, you are, yeah. Touring is particularly expensive because there's a, just a lot to pay for the venues the venues take 25% of the merchandise they take you know you have to pay the venues um you've got musicians um you've got hotels you've got trans uh, travel travels doubled and you know because of the gas prices and everything um just a lot of things have gone up and um Yeah, it's just, it's not it's not a highly profitable business for me at the moment. But I'm very grateful to be still able to keep working and keep making work good work. Yeah, you have so don't don't stop. Easy for me to say, but <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it's a lot of work. And uh, do you have like a formula uh, for writing songs? I mean, you start with a piano, guitar, or you are in the shower. Or you're in the supermarket and you see an ad and you say, "Oh, that, you know, good lyrics." Well, or, 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 or there's no formula to writing mm -hmm. good for good songs. Well, generally, it's sort of start with a sentiment or a feeling. You know, something you want to express. Yeah. Um, and then work with that. But each song is unique, and each song's journey is unique. So there is no formula. But there are things you can do to make make the ground more fertile, you know. And generally that's, you know, just daily practices that put you in a more receptive state because ultimately it's about receiving um, inspiration and stuff like that. So, no, it's all a mystery to me. It's all a very mysterious process. You have like after a jar. Period. Yeah, go Sorry? ahead. Go ahead. I said, oh, after you've got some inspiration and something that feels like it's got a soul, then you can bring in the craft, which is the, the stuff that you've learned, you know, the understanding of song structure and, you know, all of the songwriting, you know, mechanics. But, and t but that, I find that comes later once you've got a soul, like, a, 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 like the idea has a soul. Do you have like a journal where you write stuff on a daily mm -hmm. basis for that's like a good idea. I don't know how to put it together or what's the meaning, but I would write it down and then you revisit that. You yeah. Know, you're looking back for inspiration, like a, like a poet who writes stuff all the time. And then. Yeah, absolutely. I have a journal of several. Yeah. Good for you, man. So you need to be like a, like you said, you know, be, an emotional state uh, to be receptive, right? 
And from there, the quality of the artist can be receptive and emotional in some place in order to put something together, a good a good song, a good album, so forth, right? And also, you, and also you've got to live your life. You've got to live life and you've got to be open to experiences and be curious about anything and everything. So is an openness and a curiosity in general and time has to pass. And, you know, the reason why seasons of my soul was called seasons of my soul was because I used to have an apartment. I used to live in an apartment, which had a, a bedroom facing the park. It was high up and it looked out on the park. And I had been, had written these songs. I had been carrying these songs around like slow and take me as I am and all these songs. For so many years, I'd been holding them to my, you know, holding them. And um, I was watching the seasons change. And I realized that they were still relevant. Like they were still, they still, they were still, they kept coming around again. Like seasons. So which is why I kept, I called the album Seasons of My Soul. Because as I watched the seasons change outside my window, the songs still had, they, they all had a season two. You know, they would come around again. Yeah, absolutely. No, absolutely. Mm. Some of your, I'm, I'm very um, sensitive, I suppose. Um, some songs or album or artists uh, knock me out of balance. <laughs> I, I go to places with the music, right? So, uh, whether it's a, a beat song or I like the lyrics, I put on my headphone and and I go places, right? So it's music is uh, is magic to me. I don't know what it does to me. I don't know how to describe it. It's just some people cannot live without it, you know. So it's and uh, it, it's transport. It's transportive. Yeah, yeah. It's um, it's and also it, it's company as well. It's like it, it gives you. It makes you feel like you're not alone um i found that when i was young and i was obsessed with the movie musicals i found it transportive you know it take you somewhere else it would transport you somewhere and that's magic that is magical so you will kind of everybody have their own problem and their own issues and family and job and relationship whatever and you will you used to go to musical to kind of escape for a couple of hours to your own re reality and immerse in somebody else's world. And then after the gig, after the show, after the, you know, the whatever, um, the musical, you will go back to your normal life. And the problem didn't go away, obviously, but uh, you were happy for two hours and been, been able mm. to escape your own reality, right? Which yeah. is everybody... Everybody does that, right? So it's a mm. um, good way to put it, actually. Yeah, it's like an escape. And um, yeah, I, I don't know. A lot of people have asked me the same question. I, I In my case, I my dad had, in Chile, had a, a lot of music. So I began listening to music when I was a, a baby, baby, baby. And of course, um, I didn't like the music. But, um, but when I was 14, I, I discovered kind of rock and roll band from the UK, 80s. And I said, man, I really like this stuff. And uh, I began sort of collecting records when I was 14, I think. And then I was able to come to the United States. And, uh, I, and, I'm, and I'm glad that I did that. I, I knew that music was very important to me. It always had been very important, but I don't know to which extent. So I, I cannot play. <clears throat> I cannot perform, I don't know how to read music, but I thought, well, I want to keep on buying records, CDs, and uh, I'm, I'm very lucky that I'm able here where I live to see uh, close to, I don't know, 40, 50 shows a year, at least. And um, some are more expensive than others, right? So the big names mm -hmm. are more expensive, but um, I'm I'm very fortunate that I'm able to do that, and and then now, like a couple of years ago, when I began doing the interviews and calling different people over the world, um, uh, 
it, you know, all of a sudden you have a record for somebody that I bought, I don't know, 40 years ago or something. And then now I'm talking to a person. It's unbelievable. So, so I'm, I'm very fortunate, very lucky. I never thought I would be able to do this kind of stuff. It was, um, I think I, I asked you a little bit about um, this question. And um, so one minute you were, you know, where you were relatively unknown and some years later, you end up appearing on a stage with people like Elton John, Barbara Garak, Third Hall, Carpenter, Carly Simon, you know, not to mention performing at the White House in 2012. Have you, mm -hmm. do you look back at that? And uh, you, you kind of examine your life and man, you were like a little girl trying to make it and you went back your mom was sick and you went back and forth and you have like a dream and then mm. you know now 2022 you go back and say man it can it cannot be that bad because i've been with a lot of famous artists at the white house and people mm. still come to see me oh i'm I very grateful. yeah very grateful um and it, you know it was miraculous really it was it was it was a hell of a thing to get that record out seasons of my soul mm. people have no idea how much i what i had to do to get that past the powers that be you know there were i was being rejected for years you know so that record would very nearly wouldn't exist you know it was just i had to just keep going um until it until somebody did see what I was I saw in it you know um but no I I do need to reflect a bit more on what I've already done and all the amazing things I've done um yeah it's pretty incredible really it's pretty imp incredible all the things that I actually have done record label rejected you just you send a tape or demo and I don't like it we don't like it we don't like it well, people would come to my shows. I, oh. I would, you know, sing the songs, and they would, they would, A and Rs would come, and they would say, you know, this isn't, this isn't for us or whatever. Well, I'm glad you didn't give up, though. Thank you. It, it could have been easy to give up, but you didn't. So it's, uh... you can't give up. That's that's the point. That's part of the initiation. Yeah. Is that that you can that you if you have the tenacity to get past that initiation then you stand a chance of surviving the business once you get into it i realized very quickly that the music business is so uh, aggressive it's so violent that um it's so sort of spiritually violent you know it's very It's almost like kryptonite, you know, it's like it's 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 poison in many ways um, to the artist, which is ironic, considering they're supposed to be this kind of handshake or relationship, this sort of symbiosis. But it's almost like the minute you step into the music industry as a creative person, the clock starts ticking and, you know, you just get weaker and weaker and weaker. Really? Mm. They take a lot out of you or your. It's just it's 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 just a, a profound value clash. At every level. Mm. Um, it's an incompatibility, that is so fundamental. Um, that. It's just unhealthy. So, you know, you can only dip in and out of it. You can't really sustain it for very long because it will make you ill. People have died. I mean, that you know, there are artists who, you know, we see them all the time that have died. Or commit a suicide or whatever because they cannot take it anymore. Or, yeah. or the drug addiction. The dro yeah. This, but know. then people focus on the addiction, but not the mental health condition or the stresses that are underlying those addictions or what leads you to addiction or what leads, you know, the, that vulnerability. So no, it's a, it's to be a musician. Um, 
you know, like I said in my song, it is dang it can be dangerous. Mm. Some people don't seek help, unfortunately, right? So and uh they keep it to themselves and they start you know closing down by itself and they, they don't seek help, mental health or quasi psychologists, psychiatrists, whatever, and uh, and eventually they cannot take any more and then they start mm -hmm. doing pills and drugs and they just it doesn't sometimes yeah. some you know sometimes the stressful thing is what you're doing and you need to stop doing it um sometimes this you have to remove the stresses mm -hmm. but the stresses when you've got a schedule that's full and you're ill then to cancel you know it's it it wasn't you know it was it's not always possible for artists especially the more successful ones to yep. cancel a year or two years of scheduling. Yeah. Plus, if you stop canceling the show, there you you don't have any money coming in, right? So it's not um, just that. I think it's yeah. the the brutality of oh the brutality, yeah. The promoters, you know, they'll say, "Well, we won't book you again if you cancel." They don't care. There's no sensitivity to your being ill. I see. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you're ill. You're just, you just didn't, you know, you did, you, you didn't do it. So we'll book someone else next time. That kind of thing. Oh, I see. Yeah. No sympathy. And uh, it was difficult at the beginning uh, because you were a female versus a male or the, the same is for everybody. That was very interesting being a female because I didn't understand. I never experienced sexism really before you know, in my life. Yeah. Um, and until I was in the music industry, I didn't know the, 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 I didn't understand how, what it, what, what it, what it really felt like to be um, sort of diminished or sort of reduced to like the chick singer, the, uh, the turn, <laughs> the, uh, the artist. And interestingly in the music industry, there is a culture of artists sort of mocking or artists blaming or artists sort of, oh, the artists, you know, you know, they're a bit crazy or they're st stupid or, you know, there is a sort of culture of that artist blaming. Um, mm. So if something goes wrong, they'll blame the artist. Um, I mean, this is a very, this is a whole different discussion. I and mean, and also I can only speak from my individual experience. Sure. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I'm sure there are other people who've had experiences that are completely different to mine. Um, but personally, I did find it infuriating that I couldn't, I wasn't allowed to attend meetings. And I was told that if I came to the meetings, then that it would be pointless because then they couldn't talk about me. And then they wouldn't say anything because I was there. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. and I like, well, I, I like to, I'm, I just like to be collaborative. Like, well, I just want to be part of a discussion about my own career and my own thing. Like, can I not just come and collect? You know, I was very collaborative, but they, that's not how they work. Wow. Yeah. Well, it, it's very refreshing for me. Um, you know, hear from you, your experience. I'm quite sure it happens to a lot of people. Just as I say before, I, you know, I buy a record, I buy a CD, a vinyl, whatever, and have no idea how the pain and the tears. Well, it's, rec you know, record industry. It's tough, man. It's, no, it, look, you, we were survivors at the end of the day. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, uh, I feel like I'm a record industry survivor because of the experience I had. And I know other people have had those experiences too. Some people haven't had that experience at all, you know, but um, some people don't make it out alive. You know, and that's that's just the fact. Um, but that doesn't mean that I'm not grateful for the opportunity and yeah, for the experience and that I'm not glad I did it I'm just glad that I didn't I'm glad that I made it through like I'm glad that I'm okay now you know 
but it, it's it's not always and also to be fair on the record companies it's not always their fault but they have a culture of saying well we, we we'll push the artists as much as we we can and it's up to your manager to tell us no well managers can be anybody anybody you don't have to be qualified to be a manager managers vary wildly in degrees of experience and and honesty and integrity and all those things so the diff really the difference between an artist being successful and healthy and secure and everything else and not is really down to the manager i see wow so, yeah but man vary wildly wildly so can people have a good experience you know and with a manager and other people may have have mm -hmm. could have have very bad experiences because the people were unprofessional or this or that or try to take advantage or an experience I mean, experience mm -hmm. man it's tough business man mm -hmm. <laughs> uh yeah. all right let's move on to uh uh this girl is in love. Oh, uh, this Bar is Barbara and uh, David, um, some book that that uh, it's an unbelievable album, and uh, I, I really like it. Uh, Thank I like, you. I do, yeah, it's a very good album, and I read somewhere that it says that it, uh, that album is one that you couldn't have made that before. That's where you're referring to your your husband, or you were more mature and. You, well, you have, have to have a lot of experience to, to put that record, yeah. right? You have to have some experience. And also it was very, very challenging. That was a very challenging album to do vocally. Yeah. Um, the back rack is very, very difficult. And so I kind of halfway through had to just become a better singer. I had to just, I had to improve quite dramatically in order to finish it. Um, so in a way it was really, um, it was really, really positive in terms of my growth and development and, and, you know, getting better at singing, you know, so that was a good, that was a good project to do. Yeah. Uh, in the sense of what the, the rhythm were harder and you needed to train yourself to sing better or sing differently or um the melody uh, the melodies or, uh, yeah. um, and that they're, they're deceptively difficult um so they sound really easy like you know for me to make that record sounds as easy breezy as it does was really a challenging but it was a challenge i welcomed you know yeah Wow, good for you, man. All right, let's talk about a very famous album uh, called um, uh, Nashville Tears. And um, obviously are based on the song of Hugh Priestwood. And um, so a lot of questions there. Uh, where did the album title Nashville Tears came from? You were living at the, you were living here in the United States as well. In, uh, where are you? Were you were in... I know you were in the South, but at Georgia, I think, or? Uh... Started out in Arkansas. Arkansas, yeah. And then I moved to Georgia. Yeah. Um. So Nashville Tears was, hold, hold on a second, Claudia. Yeah, I just, no I need to, I need, I need to smoke a second. Yeah, no problem. Let me pause it. Tears. Yeah, go ahead. So Nashville Tears was a, was a great project for me because after Bacharach, I'd kind of completed my contractual ob obligations at Warner. Yeah. And at the, and that, that whole time had coincided with having a baby. So I had a baby and I was living in Arkansas and I was, I moved far away from the, uh, from England. I had a baby. I was out of contract with Warner and it was just like, I was kind of completely out you know, of the business at that point. Not intentionally, but it was just, that's just the way it, it landed. Um, and I hadn't been able to write any songs because I was so busy with like adjusting to motherhood and everything. 
Yeah. And I was sitting in an isolated place in a very, you know, obscure part of America. So only two people, only, I mean, there were only two industry people that contacted me during that time. One was Fred Mullen, who was a producer that said, I want to do a project with you, Rumor. I really want to do it. But he was relentless about it. And I said, well, Fred, I haven't really got anything to, I haven't got any songs yet, you know, and, I, and I'm too busy to write any. And, um, and uh, was the, the, um, and uh, Cooking Vinyls, independent label in England, said, we really want to do a project with you. And I said, well, I haven't got any songs. And in the end, I was just like, OK, look, I do have an idea for a project, but it doesn't involve writing songs. The idea was, you know, and I said to Fred, you know, the idea would be called Nashville Tears. It's a concept record. And the idea was we'd find songs from the out of Nashville that never got cut or didn't get the credit they deserved. So we ended up the cooking vinyl really wanted to work with me so they said okay yeah fine whatever project you want to do we'll do it and then the project ended up being a Hugh Presswood song but because Fred sent me a Hugh Presswood song and I said oh my god I've never heard of this guy and then he said sent me another one and another one and I said oh my god I've never I can't believe I've never heard of this guy we're gonna have to do all Hugh Presswood songs and so we decided that's what we were going to do. And that's so that's what happened. And then I and then I got sent the, all the files from the publisher of all Hugh Presswood's music. And then that began like three or four months of just listening and listening to all these beautiful songs mm. and then selecting the ones that I wanted to do and then going into like I, I explained pre-production and um, all of that and and then going to Nashville to record uh, the sessions, the rhythm section over two day, two or three days, and then brought the files home to finish them. And it was just such a joy. It was it was such a joy from start to finish. The songs, the 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 sessions, it was just brilliant fun. And so I'm very very proud of Nashville Tears. It was a lot of work, um, but it was really really brilliant and really fun and one of the biggest joys of my life to record yeah i didn't know who he was to be tell the truth <laughs> and then when i you know i knew you from the time you were doing some video with you know with daryl hall and uh sarah smile that kind of stuff um so when i was begin doing the interview i would Obviously, I would listen to all your stuff, and I didn't know who he was. And it's uh, because, in many ways, I kind of avoid country music, and I don't like the South, which I stay for other reasons. I, I could tell you if you want. And uh, and uh, but this album is not about country music in many ways. Mm, that's what I like about it. Yeah, it's any... not. It's not. Yeah, country music, and and the guy is very good. Um, and the interpretation, I, I have not heard the original stuff by Hugh, but the way you call the song are very, very beautiful. I mean, obviously you are a very talented musician as a singer, but the guy was a unbelievable writer to put something together. So, Yeah, um, and he, he, he yeah. was, um, there's something mystical about his writing. And yeah. what also that I was trying to capture in that record personally mm. was, kind of through through my selection if you like and through yeah. my desire to do his work yeah. was to somehow create a record that would tell would be a country record but it would also be a very like a, almost like a love letter to the Mer America in terms of like the land and what makes what creates this sort of sense of American pride beyond politics and beyond, there is something that connects all Americans, whether regardless of their politics, and that is their love of the actual land. Absolutely, yeah. Physical land, and that's where country music is at its best, when it's expressing that pride and affection for the land. And I felt like the selection that I had chosen i felt like if i pull back far enough it 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 was a landscape 
of America, you know, it, it, it felt like the landscape that I was seeing outside my car window and, you know, the love and pride I'd felt from people about their country, regardless of politics and also the love that I felt for the land as well, which I, I got a lot of healing from, you know, all the healing I was talking about from the, you know, having to restore my soul after the, you know, the music business situation was, was America, you know, the land, you know, healed, healed me. Good, good for you. Mm. It was difficult to be questioned. It was difficult to adjust uh, coming from London to Georgia and the South, deep South in the United States. Mm -hmm. It uh, It's hostile. Hard. South is actually, I feel, a little hostile to immigrants because it's very much centered around, they're very tribal in the South. Yeah. They're very centered around your church and your church community. Um, either your family and your, you know, there's many, many generations of family. If you're lucky enough to have a family that has many generations, so you have, a, tr you know, your own tribe. But if you don't, then your next best bet is to find your community within your church. But if you don't go to church regularly and you don't find your community in church, you're pretty much out, like you're pretty much on the outside of society in the South. So was it difficult for you to uh, meet friends or people you get along? Not, not British people, yeah. Right? but yeah, American. Yeah. yeah, it's harder to make friends because people yeah. generally are more, well, also because everything's just bigger and less immediate. So you're not walking around, you're in your car. So you're generally kind of traveling around intentionally. So you're going somewhere intentional. Whereas like in London, you could unintentionally meet people all the time um, and have mm -hmm. conversations every day about this and that and nothing. Whereas, you know, having to get in the car is very isolating and, and just, it's just less opportunities to meet people. Mm -hmm. Um, And also, I think I find Americans a bit more insular in that they're in their world. They've got their world kind of. It's but well in the South, I found that they you know they had their people, they've got their family, they've got their cousins, they've got their church, they've got their community, and it's it's just very tribal and. Like, like I said, without, if you're not in the church community, you know, like for example, here in England or Europe, if you have a baby, you, there are like baby groups or mums and baby groups where people who don't know each other can come and meet other mothers and, you know, have a coffee morning or something. There are things that people do where you're not expected to know the, the other people, but In America, they don't really have things that are organized beyond the churches, mm -hmm. like the South. And like, you know, the church organizes activities, but there are, it's, it's mainly church related. Right. So if you don't, if you are not a religious person or you like a different type of church or you don't care about church, then mm. you keep on isolating yourself right yeah and I, I i had i wanted to go to church but i my my son has a sensory had a sensory aversion to it yeah so he didn't, uh like going um and he found it too loud and too noisy so i couldn't go to church but um i was i you know I, the first thing i wanted to do was find a church community but i couldn't you know i wasn't able to do that but But I did notice that that everything is organized in, within churches and around churches and in church communities. Yeah. And then eventually, how the record did? Were you able to tour a little bit with the record? No, no, not really. There was 2020 when it came out, so yeah, yeah. No story. But we did we did do the tour eventually in 2022. So you end up you. You reach a point in your life, and I don't need to know you. You say, "Well, 
the sub was great. I make that great album, but I'm a British woman with a husband. Uh, I need to go back to my own roots. So I kind of eventually you you. Yeah. No, I think it was just like I wanted. Um, I just wanted my son to have a bit more of my culture. Sure. Um, and also to see my friends and family who I hadn't seen in years. Yeah. And it just felt like the right time to come home. Yeah. You, I, thoroughly, son... I really enjoyed the South. I enjoyed yeah. the people. I enjoyed the everything about it. I, it was a, a wonderful experience, but, you know, it was just time to come home. Yeah, I know. I know what you mean. Uh, mm. you, your son speaks like you with the accent, the British accent. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have like an American accent. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the, and the, yeah, I've been living here in the United States for so many years that I, this is home for me, right? Although I travel all over the mm -hmm. world, but the, the North part of the United States is very different from the South part of the United States. I mean, you exchange the South, a lot of land in the North, less mm -hmm. land, more buildings. Yeah, and it's state. The state yeah, everything's so it's, it's different, right? So, from state to state, again, it's so different. Yeah. And I can't generalize about America because yeah, there are like even in the red states, there are so many progressives. Yeah, there are you know LGBTQ communities. Yeah, there are liberal factions. There's all sorts of people doing things in every red state you know yeah, yeah. So each red state is actually kind of 50 50 in terms of their viewpoints you know that that you can't really generalize yeah. and there's so many people that has got different views yeah and with all the pros and cons and this republican democrat of these that this is According to me, that's the best, the best country in the world. Give me a, a second opportunity in my life, and um, you know, with the good and the bad, there is the best. I'm very proud to be a U.S. citizen. It has given me the opportunity to go to show, to go to school. I went to school here and uh, make a good living during the day, and it um, has been very good to me. I'm very proud to be a U.S. citizen, although. I may not agree with all the stuff, but uh, it's mm. a lot of good people, you know, and I respect right. everybody where you are, you know, male, female, in between or this. I I, mm -hmm. I have a, a lot of friends and uh, I'm trying to be respectful with everybody and I may not agree with certain policy or that, this or that, mm -hmm. but, you know, have been, this country has been very good to me, so I'm very proud to be here. Mm -hmm. And that's what I like yes, about Nashville yeah. Tears. I hope yeah. that Nashville Tears is something that sort of catch catches the sort of the essence of America. Absolutely, yeah. Or Americana in that through that portrait. That's what I was trying to do. Is you know, Hugh Presswood is very um, conservative. You know. Yeah. I, I we don't share all the same views but that was partly why it was so interesting mm. here in the united states as you know right very divide between progressive mm. and conservatives and the role of religion and mm. is kind of um i suppose difficult to adjust or difficult to understand but mm. Um, I, I agree with certain things. I disagree with other stuff. Uh, you know, my wife and I see things very differently. And and uh, my son is in between. And uh, But, but it, it's good to have, actually, it's very good to have different opinions and have the freedom to express yourself in some other countries like China or Russia Hey, this is the way it is, and if you don't like it, you go to prison, you go to jail, you disappear or whatever. So uh, it, it's it's good to people argue, and there is different point of view, and you're able to express your point of view. Um, 
and the inter internet that people can complain and vote for that person mm -hmm. or the person. Some people, you know, are more religious than others, are more conservative, are more progressive than others. But and uh, and uh, but it's good. It's good to have options. Some countries don't have options. Look at all the mess in Russia and Ukraine and all the stuff. I feel so bad for the stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. It's crazy world that we live in, man. There is. Yeah, unbelievable, man. Happy to be alive, man. Uh, recently, you released an album called uh, B Size and Rarities, Volume Two. It's a very good album, actually. Thank you. I just I do those periodically because um um. People asked me to do them. I think that I did the first one, besides one, because um, people were coming to shows with their CDs that they'd made themselves, you know, of like extra tracks. And I thought, I need to do that properly. So I did it properly and I'll keep doing them as long as I've got extra stuff. I'll happily keep doing them if people like them. Yeah. You you, you like that people send you stuff, man. This, this is a very good singer from this country playing that music and will you will you do a cover for that and you collect I suppose enough song and to put another well no what they, you they were, so, right, yeah what they did was they gave they found uh they would find tracks that I had done that yeah, I, uh, I see. compiled them and then made their own CDs which made me think oh I should do that properly put that together properly with a you know proper release yeah. So what I did, but um, no, I don't mind anybody sending me anything or um, talking to me about any anything, you yeah. know. You prefer to do covers, or you prefer to do? Of course, you prefer to do your own stuff or, or revisit heard... your revisit your stuff you did back in the day when you're perhaps. Um, I like both. Doing, yeah, I mean, I I don't I don't sort of believe that um, it's less authentic to cover. I think it's actually. It's quite interesting. It uses a different set of skills yeah. to cover or to interpret um, some somebody else's work. And also, I enjoy other people's work because it gets me out of my own uh, head. And also, you learn doing it. You learn something about other songwriters as well. So I, there are lots of reasons I like doing it. I feel like it's complementary. Yeah, you know? I think it's a spider. I'm just something on the wall. I'm not sure if it's a spider. Oh my god! I hope it's not a spider. You wanna kill it? <laughs> or hold on. Yep. I've got much time. I'm gonna have to go soon. Yep. I got you. No, I did. I have only two more questions. Um, uh, so my understanding is that now you you're touring with the ladies as part of the women to women. Yeah. And uh, feel free to elaborate how this um, is going. And you are uh, playing with with Julia, uh, Judy, and Beverly. And uh, it's and, going uh, really well. well. Yeah. Um, I wanted to do this tour because I thought I could learn a lot from the experience, and also yeah. because I have stage anxiety. I thought this would be a good practice for me to get on stage and not feel all the pressure. Yeah. Of having to carry a whole show. Um, and actually, it has been really positive fr from that perspective. I haven't been as scared, and I'm hoping to sort of trick my body into maybe being less scared in the future. Mm. Um, but it's, um, it's yeah, it's been really well received so far. We've got three shows down and 15 more to go. So for you, that's yeah. really nice. That is only going to be in the for, as as of now for in the UK, or is possible to definitely uh, expand in Europe. No, I think that's that's the last time they want to do it. They want to do it, so it's uh, this will be the last time they do the woman to woman um, thing. But I mean, I've got plenty of shows booked next year, and I've got a record that I'm working on. So I've got lots of projects that I'm working on as well. So um, there'll be more to come from me. Good for you. Do you plan mm -hmm. to uh, so a new record? And you coming to the United States? To, you're going to be touring here, or just in the in, in Europe? Or that would be really nice. I mean, that again, it budget. It's all about budgets. Yeah. Um, it's how to make it work. Um, now I, I definitely would like to do Argentina, Chile, and Mexico. Yep, absolutely. Uh, so I must maybe I need a South American promoter or something like that. Um, 
but yeah, I definitely want to get back in the saddle and do more shows and do more traveling again, for sure. Good for you. All right. Uh, it was very nice talking to you. And uh, hopefully I will see you in London next month. And uh, and uh, because I'm going to be in Portugal with my son for uh, some events, music is related. Oh. I, I send you an email, right? So I'm going um, during Thanksgiving week. Um, I'm off of work. He's off school. So we'll go to Portugal. Um, the some folks from the band called Dead Contents are going to be touring. I don't know if you know Lisa Gerard. Yeah. 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 So I'm going to be meeting her and Jewel Maxwell and then um other um musicians that have worked with her and have done film scores. It's unbelievable, very good stuff. And then that is um and I think I'm going to have dinner with um I don't know if Brian Eno is going to be there, but his brother is going to be performing. And then after that, I was planning to um, fly to the UK. And I think you're playing uh, the last show, which is the 26th in Cambridge, the Corn mm -hmm. Exchange. Very likely I'm going to be there. And then that's ah. like on a Friday and then Saturday we need to fly back and then Monday go to work. So, you know, hopefully we can get to where, you know, or a, yeah. a picture or a beer or whatever. And uh, I would love to get some autograph stuff from you. So I'll put you on the guest list. Just let me know how many. Yeah, all the, the, the two of us. So I will, I will email you. And uh, thanks again for your time. Uh, you're an unbelievable person. And um, thank you for <laughs> opening up and as well as stranger. <laughs> you haven't heard the last from me because now you you volunteered to do my help me with my Spanish translations. That's right. You feel free to send me everything that you. Oh, I will. Uh, I, you, I, and I send I, you, I send you an email with four tracks. I don't yes. know if you haven't. It there are kind of. Uh, I look at the best. I suppose uh, 20 Latin American songs ever written from different countries of Latin America. And, uh, and uh, I send you a sample for our, those are very well known. So it's hard to sing them, but they're well known. So if you, I'm here to help you with pronouncing or translator or the other song that you mentioned before, you know, you know where to find me. So. Thank you. I will. I will definitely be in touch because I've been praying for someone to help me with these translations. I will. So. I'm happy, happy to, happy to help you. And hopefully, we'll meet uh, face to face yeah. in, in London in yeah. next month. We will. Thank you very much. It was very nice Thank talking you. to you. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.